Okay. It's my pleasure to welcome uh, Hari Haran Devarajan, uh, who is currently a postdoc at uh, Lawrence Livermore National Lab. Um, he, he graduated from Illinois Institute of Technology with the same advisor I uh, was working with. Um, so he's an academic brother and, uh, and he recently worked on characterizing uh, IO behavior of large scale scientific deep learning applications. And he presented this at uh, CC Grid and won the best paper award there. Um, so uh, welcome, uh, Hari. And uh, yeah, uh, just for the audience, if you have any questions in the middle, please uh, leave, uh, leave them in the chat. And at the end of the talk, uh, we'll have enough time to um, go through and unmute your um, microphone and uh, ask your question. Right, thank you and uh, Hari, go ahead. Thank you, Suren, for inviting me to give this talk. Um, so as Suren said, I am Hari. You could all call me Hari instead of the long name he used. And I'm a postdoctoral researcher at Livermore Lab, uh, working with Catherine Moore. Uh, so I, I decided of, on this talk because I think it's kind of interesting. We've been trying to do characterization of IO behavior for our simulations and different kinds of applications throughout time. And now with all these uh, scientific deep learning applications there, uh, it was kind of a needed step in a way to kind of figure out how do these work at large scale? What are their IO needs and so on? Uh, this work was done as a part of a collaboration between Argonne and IIT Chicago uh, during my PhD thesis. So yeah, let's get started. Okay. So the basic idea is that sci scientists utilize deep learning methods to reduce the comp computational complexity of their applications. It is used in a variety of domains such as material science, biology, physics, and many more as shown on the right. Efficient ingestion and processing of data is essentially very crucial for effectiveness of these deep learning methods. And it's, it's been kind of proven in the cloud environments. However, the data characteristics of deep learning methods in scientific domains is not well understood. Um, just to give a brief background on how deep learning frameworks and methods work, so generally popular DL frameworks uh, you, such as TensorFlow, PyTorch, and CAFE provide an infrastructure to optimize data management required by these deep learning models. In general, you could look at a deep data management within any deep learning technique having three phases. The first is the data ingestion. That is how the data is read by several sources into memory for input processing. Then there is data processing. That is what data operators are applied <clears throat> to the in-memory data before feeding it to the training. And finally, it has data uh, communication. That is how data exchange occurs between various workers of the deep learning training framework. These phases have their own software and hardware optimizations that are supported by these deep learning frameworks. Okay. So in this work, uh, when we started this work, we were we observed that there is a lack of understanding of how exactly IO behavior for these scientific deep learning applications work at scale. So our goal was to systematically characterize various scientific deep learning applications and build a representative benchmark to enable IO research for improving efficiency of these deep learning applications in HPC environment. So to, for this, we basically, in this work, I present the DLIO, which is a data-centric benchmark for DL applications. The code is publicly available at the GitHub repo mentioned there. And I'll also have the slide at the end, which shows the same repo. So to achieve this representative benchmark, um, we need to first understand the IO behavior, obviously, of the scientific deep learning applications. And for this, we use the applications present at Argon Leadership Computing Facility because they, they had a lot of applications from uh, new projects which were upcoming. So we use that as a use case for the study. So in this study, basically, we, we utilize the production supercomputer at ALCF, which is Theta, and all the applications were part of ongoing products, uh, projects in Argonne targeted towards the next exascale era as listed on the right. Uh, we run these applications with 128 KNN nodes over Luster file system, which we saw having a peak bandwidth of 240 gigabytes per second. All these applications utilize TensorFlow framework, 
Therefore, we utilize its internal profiler along with Darshan for low-level IO profiling. Also, we built an analysis tool which will basically combine the higher level details from TensorFlow Profiler with the lower level IO profiling from Darshan and provide a more holistic view of the IO behavior. All these, all the results I will be kind of showing during this categorizations are from this tool. So I'll first kind of go to, towards the uh, eight applications we looked at uh, from various projects in this work. And we'll see how each of these applications, what are their high level goals and what are their basic data set. And also all this discussion would be very data centric. So for first, well, we looked at a neutrino and cosmic tagging with UNET, also known as cosmic tagger. This application basically uses deep learning to separate cosmic pixels, background pixels and neutrino pixels within images. The application had a 33 gigabyte data set containing 43,000 samples stored in one large HDF5 file with each sample with an average size of 40 kilobytes. The deep learning model itself is run over 150 steps with a batch size of 32 images. The next we looked at was the distributed version of the flood failing network implemented in TensorFlow. In this application, the deep learning model segments the brain tissue image into complex and large shapes of neurons. The application had a small 2.3 gigabyte data set with 19,000 samples, each of size 32 kilobytes. The deep learning model itself trains over this data set uh, over 150 steps with a batch size of 32 samples. Then we looked at a couple of uh, TensorFlow based applications. Well, one of them was CosmoFlow Benchmark, which is used in studying the features or in the distributed dark matter in the universe. So this application is basically written in TensorFlow with a two terabyte data set present in TF record format. The data set consists of 256K samples spread across 1000 uh, TF record files, and the training runs over 256K steps with one large one image in each training step. Then we have the popular Candle uh, application, which is basically Cancer Distributed Learning Environment Project. This application basically classifies RNA sequence gene to detect normal or tumor issue in the image. Um, it has 700 megabyte data set, which consists of uh, 1020, uh, 120 records with each record size of 256 kilobyte. The data set is stored and read using CSV format and the deep learning uh, models basically consume the entire data set through 60 epochs with a batch size of 20 records at a time. Next, uh, we lo also looked at a few other applications such as fusion recurrent neural nets, uh, which basically was used in uh, prediction disruption in fusion plasmas. The application in this case used a six gigabyte data set, which was presented in NumPy array files distributed across two megabyte files, each containing 1024 samples. The training model used 100 estimates with a batch size of 512 samples. Um, the next is the ImageNet benchmark, which was modified to run on theta uh, with all the scripts and everything. Uh, in, it basically is the same image classification application, which uses popular combinational models such as ResNet 50 and AlexNet. The benchmark itself consists of two terabyte uh, TF record files with 1024 files, each containing uh, 4096 samples with 256 kilobyte sample size. The training within the deep learning model runs over a thousand steps with a batch, batch size of 32 kilobytes. The last two applications, I'm gonna talk about them together because uh, both the deep learning climate segmentation benchmark and the Hamilton Monte Carlo simulation basically uses deep learning, but they generate data in memory. So they do not perform the initial data ingestion that uh, I talked about in the three phases. Uh, now let's look at each of these application and what they actually did based on our tool which characterized what is going on. So in all of these tools you would see at the top like I would have a timeline where I have IO and computation uh, below that and then uh, and then there could be some distributions of request sizes so I'll be talking through some of these figures and what were the main conclusions in all of these applications. So in case of Cosmic Tiger, we observed that 22% of the overall time was uh, spent in performing IO. The data set essentially is read sequentially 
but it achieves a very low bandwidth of 11 megabytes per second of aggregate across all processes. Uh, this low bandwidth was basically due to small transfer size of request. Uh, if you remember, uh, the each sample size within Cosmic Tagger is 40 kilobytes around a median, and they do 32 batch size. So it should not have been smaller, but when we looked at the actual data, HDFI data set, it was chunked with a very small data size matching the page size of the application of the system, which is like four kilobytes. So they used a very small chunk size because of which the accesses became really small and the IO was inefficient. Um, as shown in the timeline on top, uh, overall only like 10% of the overall IO was overlapped behind uh, model computation, which is kind of important for any, any of these AI applications because computations run on separate resources. So you generally want good overlap between your IO and, uh, uh, and computation. For distributed flood filling networks, um, uh, we see that 18% of the overall time was performed in uh, IO. The data set itself consumed, uh, was consumed by multiple processes and achieved an overall bandwidth of 11 gigabytes per second. Um, the distribution of transfer sizes were centered around 64 kilobytes and 100 bytes. And essentially, again, we saw that this, this was due to the chunking, how the two files, the metadata and the data files were chunked. So the 100 bytes is for the metadata file and the 64 kilobytes you see here is for the data file, how it was chunked. Uh, there is no overlap in this application we saw between IO and computation. For the Cosmoflow benchmark, which was basically written in Utila TensorFlow data pipeline, we see only 12% of the overall time was spent in IO. Uh, the application runs over four epochs with an aggregate bandwidth of 36 gigabytes per second. That was the maximum um, bandwidth we saw in any of the applications. Like whenever we were using TensorFlow data pipeline, it actually gave very good bandwidth from the Palafile system. Um, the data was evenly distributed among all the processes of training. Uh, we saw that the transfer size of each request within the, applica within the application was exactly 256 kilobyte. Even if like the samples were smaller or bigger, this was basically due to the way TensorFlow internally does IO. It uses a fixed transfer size that you can configure, but the default size was 256 kilobytes, so that's what it does. And um, the application itself completely overlaps IO with compute. And one of the other interesting things we saw here was that out of the 23% um, that was spent in the input pipeline, overall 11% around was uh, on the data processing, pre-processing in memory. Uh, the ImageNet benchmark, again, similar to the Cosmoflow benchmark, it's also written in TensorFlow using TF records. And this, this application spent about 15% of its overall time in IO with an aggregate bandwidth, again, of 32 gigabytes per second. Um, it reads the data set on demand. Uh, unlike the Cosmoflow benchmark, which reads all the data set evenly, it kind of goes based on how many time steps you're reading it. So based on the time step, it will read the data set on demand. And then there is, because of this, there is a non-uniform distribution. If you look at the lower right uh, corner here, you'll see that some files are read more than others. Uh, that's basically because of that. And the transfer size, uh, when we looked at it again, was the default 256 kilobytes. And all the IO that we saw was completely uh, overlapped with the compute, which was going on behind. The candle application, which is the cancer application, uh, basically reads data from the CSV data sets and spends 36% of its time in performing IO. Uh, Basically in this case, because it's a CSV data format and the API they were using, each process reads the whole data set row by row with an aggregate bandwidth of eight gigabytes per second. They got the eight gigabyte per second aggregate bandwidth because each row luckily was big enough, like 256 kilobytes in size. So they got good transfer size on each process. However, one thing that each, this, this 700 megabyte was read by each process in the application. So currently the data set was only 700 megabytes. So it, it worked uh, because it could fit in memory. Also in the, as we observe in the timeline, like only one thread was basically used uh, uh, to perform this IO and there was no overlap or in no asynchronicity between IO and computation. Once all the IO was done, you do the training. And then once all the test data was read, you do the testing. So that's kind of how this application worked.
The FRNN application, which used NumPy arrays as its data set, uh, spends about 23% of the overall time in I.O. It reads a six gigabyte data set uh, using NumPy APIs with an aggregate bandwidth of 28 gigabytes. There were two types of requests in this, uh, in this particular application. What, there was always one request on the metadata file, which is a smaller file, and then uh, the whole uh, two megabyte chunks of uh, signal files, they call it, were read in one go. So that's kind of, that's why the frequency of metadata calls dominate within the application. If you again, look at the bottom right corner, the smaller IO is all from the metadata and the bigger IOs are from the complete uh, chunk of reading those numpy arrays in one go. Um, again, in this application, we saw that there was essentially no overlap between compute and IO. For the last two applications, as I said before, uh, we, they do not perform any disk reading. As uh, so, however, when we ran these applications, we saw that they do some periodic checkpoints. So we were profiling that, and we saw that even for the they they actually perform like uh, models on billions of uh, pa parameters and so on. So if, even for those kinds of large models, the amount of checkpointing data was in tens of megabytes and uh, using SDDIO interface of, uh, with TensorFlow. And we saw that the write time was less than one person. So for these cases, we really didn't uh, look into more into like what kind of pattern because they were just written in one go, very small files and very fixed number of files per epoch. So uh, it was very, very fast by TensorFlow itself, which was checkpointing. So, I know it's it's a lot of applications I talked about, so I thought I would put a summary slide, just, just the main takeaways I want everyone to kind of remember out of these eight applications. We could kind of classify these eight applications based on the data format they used. So for Cosmic Tagger and Distributed Flock Filling Networks, TFFN, they use HDF5. For Cosmo4 and ImageNet Benchmark, they use TF records and others in a way like Candle or FRNN, which use CSV or NumPy array or any you know specific uh, APIs. Uh, for the HDF5 workload in general, we, we saw that like they use a single large file with parsex VFD uh, in HDF5 file. Uh, there is no framework level integration within TensorFlow. What I mean by that is generally they are executed in the Python th main thread and then everything is passed down, the data is passed down to TensorFlow because of which they, they run on a different runtime than the, so they are not really parallelized. Whatever parallelization happens has to happen by, has to be done by the application developers themselves. And this basically forces application developers to manually perform sample shuffling, input pipeline design, and whatever features they want, like that, that even TensorFlow kind of shows that they have those features and they could be useful to basically developers are building them on their own. And because of that, we saw that because it's running on different time, uh, different runtimes and not utilizing all the cores, there is a lot of serialization between IO and compute phases within the application without any possibility of overlap. So that's kind of one of the things we saw common in the HDF5 uh, set of applications here. For the TensorFlow TF record data format, um, generally the data set is represented into multiple files. And these files are chosen by the framework at random. So you generally give a glob of file or a path and then they, they, they choose these to balance load and so on and so forth. And then they utilize independent IO to, uh, with protobufs deserialization to read the samples out of the file. Uh, the framework itself for IO and pre-processing supports kind of parallelism. So they have some default values. You could use specific values based on your architecture, or you could use even uh, advanced features like auto tuning that they have where they kind of do some internal profiling to figure out what's the best value for your system. And it kind of works very well. Um, on top of that, they have some nice optimizations such as data compression, caching, prefetching that you could like just easily insert in your application using a couple of lines of code. Finally, uh, we observe that these files are read sequentially on demand. So the way TensorFlow works is kind of uh, 
it, it basically runs a bigger, reads a bigger chunk of IO in memory and then shuffles it if the, if the application wanted it to shuffle. So it does not do shuffled IO within the file because of which it always reads large, big chunks of IO and then deserialize them and then do whatever shuffling they want to do in memory, which, which turns out to be very good for IO, right? So they work inherently well with the PAL file system because of that. And uh, for other data formats, uh, basically it kind of boils down to what interface they use. For instance, for CSV, they use the normal fopen interface because of uh, like uh, the, sorry, the CSV interface within Python, which does not let you do anything but row by row. But if they have used something smarter, like let's say pandas or Dask, they might be able to do something more smarter. So it's kind of boiled down to what interface you use and how you read the data. And there is no inherent like optimization logics, at least in those two applications that you could do because of the interfaces they're using. So, uh, so that's why I put them into others because they're very specific and um, rare cases, I would say, like when I was talking to the developers, they, they basically didn't want to change it to any other format because of ease of use or they were more familiar with these formats. Um, so that's kind of how it was. Um, so, after, after looking at this classification, what we thought was it would be useful to build a benchmark suit which can represent these, these, these uh, uh, features of these eight applications accurately. And any other application which might have a similar, because most of AI uh, applications work on a kind of set of similar features. So the idea was to use these eight to build a representative benchmark and then even, you know, uh, change, start building other benchmarks as, as you want, or you could, you could change the parameters and start seeing different patterns and so on and so forth. So we show the design of the benchmark itself on the right. It's a very straightforward benchmark. Uh, the benchmark is configured using arguments, uh, which configures the internal parameters of the benchmark. Uh, the execution of the benchmark, uh, we have like a modular format handler, which through which you can just add Python files to the benchmark and add more format support. Uh, additionally, we support fine grain profiling through the benchmark within the benchmark itself uh, for understanding the behavior of the workload. Finally, uh, we also support data generation so that we can emulate data scaling tests for our applications. Because as I said, most of these applications are using very small data sets. So it might be useful to generate your own data based on a particular pattern and then, and then run your application on top of it. Uh, the DLIO benchmark in its current state uh, on the repo supports the following configurations such as TF record, HDF5, CSV, NumPy arrays. Uh, the file access pattern could be shared or multiple files with independent or collective IO. This depends upon the type of interface you selected. Some of them support independent uh, collective IO, some of them don't. Uh, we can emulate different data set reading patterns such as sequential or random um, because some, in some cases you want to see that. Again, this is based on the support from the interfaces. Also, uh, the two types of IO we look at here is first is the major one, which is the data set reading. Uh, also, we also added a part for model checkpointing such that the application would checkpoint every n step. So it basically emulates what the application, a TensorFlow application was doing as I described before. And then finally, uh, you could tune the request size distribution within our benchmark for these interfaces so that you could kind of look at different IO patterns and so on and so forth. So to kind of evaluate this benchmark, um, we use a similar setup as before on the Theta supercomputer, the workloads we use. So essentially what we do is we run the emulated versions of the benchmark with different regression tests, like, okay, let's change the transfer size, let's change parallelism, so on and so forth. And these run fairly quickly because they are not actually running the actual computation, we emulate the computations here. So uh, you could kind of tune them to not do any computations and just look at IO itself. And based on that, you could figure out what are the best parameters for optimizing your IO within the application. And once you have that, you we apply them to the actual scientific AI applications and then measure their in, the impact of our optimizations and how well it works. Uh, before we do the actual analysis, what we wanted to make sure was at least like, because we modeled our benchmark towards the eight applications, we wanted to make sure the characteristics of the application and the benchmark are similar on these parameters that we are showing in the table. 
And in general, there is about 6% variance uh, and, uh, between the application and the benchmark. And it's, this is primarily because of uh, in the application, you might have a complex distribution of request sizes, but to simplify the benchmark, what we did is we just take the median of requests, uh, which we saw does pretty well in most cases. So that's what we use. Because of that, it's not exactly the application, but very close to it. Uh, then uh, we, we have, I have more um, optimizations we have shown on HDFI as well on the paper, but I'm, I'm showing Cosmo flow here because I think that's also interesting here, like for the Cosmo flow application, as I said, it, it gets a lot of um, bandwidth already. Right. But if you, if you, if you, if you think about it, the default uh, stripe size on luster is about a megabyte and they use 256 kilobytes. So the idea here was that can we apply the D DLIO version of Cosmo flow application? We tried different optimizations such as different transfer sizes so that it matches your, um, matches your uh, luster file system better, read parallelism, pre-processing parallelism, all these three factors we kind of played with different numbers based upon the machine. And then we measure what, which gave the best performance in terms of IO. And then we applied those parameters back to the actual application, the ideal ones. And essentially uh, what the paper shows is that you could, you could kind of get very consistent optimization benefits. It might not be the same because the benchmark only does sometimes IO and things like that, but you'll see the benefit uh, still there, like a relative benefit to the application is still there. So that kind of is nice to kind of quickly do the, all your regression test on the benchmark and then come back and just apply the optimization because it's basically a combinatorial problem, right? So it's, it helps with all these uh, benchmarks to do that for you. Um, also, as you have seen, the eight applications don't really use large data because these data sets were generated by simulations and they're working with very specific problems. So what we did here is the data generation model can basically generate for the same pattern, we could generate bigger scales so that we could start doing some strong scaling or weak scaling test on the application, whatever we want. So the complete set of results are there in the paper, but essentially they all look as follows. Like for instance, on the left, we have the ImageNet benchmark, which uses multiple files per application. And as we, as we increase more processes to do the same work, uh, the total uh, number of files that we see uh, maintain a very good performance as the scale increases. Whereas on the right, which uses a shared file uh, within, uh, this is the emulation of the DDN, uh, DFFN, sorry, application. Uh, here, the HDF5, as we talked about it, it's not really well integrated with application and hence it's uh, kind of starts, as you increase scale, you'll have, start having more and more serial portions of IO, which which makes it further away from the optimal IO performance. Uh, one of the main things I wanna also kind of, before I wrap up this talk was, um, I wanted to also talk about some of the key learnings I think that we had uh, throughout this work. Uh, first of it is, um, I think most of us would agree that you cannot study IO in an isolated setting. Like you need to look at, the computations from CPU, GPU to really get a good picture of which part of IO is required to be optimized. Like for instance, on the top application, you will see like there are clear phases of IO and compute because of the way the APIs work on candle, that's the candle figure. So in that case, you it, it makes sense to like look at isolated and you can do it. Whereas in the second figure, as you see, there are some portion, all the IO is always smaller than the computation portions below. So you don't really need to optimize IO because you need to optimize compute in that case to reduce our overall time. Otherwise you won't see any difference. So that's why like, that's kind of important to look at IO, not only isolated, but kind of together to make sure uh, your optimizing optimizations would be worth it. And that's a challenge in current scenario. And I'll talk about why that's my next point is if we wanted to look at different components, right? Such as now you have CPUs, you have an IO subsystem, such as interfaces you're looking at, and even GPU. Uh, in that case, then you need to collect these traces from different sources. GPU, you might be collecting it from some NVIDIA utility. CPU, you're using some form of CPU-based profiler. IO, you're using Darshan. And then you have to now combine all of them together uh, into a single 
application timeline. And we saw that that's not that trivial to do because all of these have different ways. They have represented log. Uh, you need to, even if you parse them, their time scales, where that exact pointer happens because there is a complex software stack involved, it's kind of difficult to say uh, which part is executed when. And if you, if, you, if you are doing timeline analysis of overlap, you need to be as accurate as possible. So for this work, what we did was we added markers on Darshan, uh, like IO markers, like just I'll put a simple byte out at the start of the application and end so that we could kind of look at the TensorFlow profiler and match it. But you can't always do that with your application, but that's kind of challenging at the end to figure out how you want to do it. Um, in terms of IO requests uh, themselves, like application in a lot of our cases the application was doing bigger io but because of the way hdfi was chunked or the data set was chunked honestly the scientists probably didn't even know they just whenever the simulation generated those data sets they're just been using it but the chunking of that data set basically determined what was the actual transfer size and because of which we saw a lot of inefficient io and through the benchmark some of the results actually show like when we use um, uh, DLIO to generate larger, same pattern, but larger chunk sizes within the data set. Everything is the same, just I uh, increase the chunk size. You'll start seeing way better performance from the Palafal system. And that's obvious, but point is you could start doing those kinds of analysis using the benchmark. And that's important to kind of understand that what application does does not guarantee the transfer sizes you will see at the end. Um, also in terms of TensorFlow's data pipeline itself, we saw that it's, it's very efficient on the Palafile system, basically because of large sequential IO does. And you could go ahead and further optimize it to match it exactly to the Lester file system, and it'll, you'll start getting way better performance out of the, out of the Palafile system. And in this case, uh, just to put a quick note here, which I didn't talk about it too much in detail, the CosmoFlow application originally had its data set in HDF5, and there was one work which converted this HDF5 data sets into TF records to make IO better. So, and, and after that conversion, the, there is a conversion cost obviously, but after the conversion, the IO within the application is way better. So it, it kind of helps maybe like you, if you use the native uh, format because the, because the framework works well with it, but it's kind of a challenge to use a non non-cloud-based or that uh, framework-based IO uh, format within, of, within your application if you're building a science application. And finally, I, would, I want to comment on this and probably a lot of people will have a comment on this one statement, but I, when, when I was doing this research initially and I was doing a lot of background work, I got an impression from the community that, oh, you know, a uh, lot of AI workloads in HPC use raw images and hence would perform a lot of random IO. It is true, a lot of smaller benchmarks do that. But in, in this case, I wanna kind of highlight at least what we found is people no longer do that. They Even in the cloud world, they either com combine them into TF records or NumPy arrays or some format. All these are our images in these, in these examples, most of these, except for candle, which was numerical numbers. Um, all of the else were actually images and they all combine them into different formats to, to have a bigger group instead of just looking at individual images. Uh, so they do that now. And so it's not necessarily always that it will do random IO because for instance, the way Cosmo, uh, Cosmic Tiger and DFFN were actually doing it was that they were reading 32 images at a time from the HD5 file. And then to avoid doing real random IO, they would go and monotonically increase their offsets so that it's still in a way for the PAL file system sequential like, and then they'll come back and do other chunks. So they, they did a lot of smartness point being to optimize their IO within from the HD5 file itself so that they are working it well. So. Um, it's not like it's a given assumption. Yeah, it could depend on the applications, but the applications we see generally don't directly work on raw images. They generally work through a higher level library, which is good because we could do a lot of optimizations on IO because of that. So um, in summary, um, in this talk, we kind of talked about the behavior of modern uh, scientific deep learning applications that we saw at ALCF. Uh, we developed a benchmark that accurately represents these applications and can be utilized for IO optimization. 
And finally, uh, through benchmarking the paper, we show that like you could do scaling tests. And in general, we saw that you need better support for scientific data formats in deep learning frameworks, but better, better data exchange between scientific simulations and AI to work better in these systems. So thank you for your attention. I'll be glad to take any questions. Thank you, Harry, for a nice presentation.